I now get to introduce our first speaker and let you know that it is with great remorse that we do not have Linda Black Elk with us today. She is ill and was not able to get here. Um, and it's for all of our good that she didn't come. So thank her for not coming and sorry to us that she's not here. We'll either have her next year or we'll figure out how to get her recording available to you all post haste. Um, instead, I'm going to introduce, so we're changing the schedule up a bit. You're just gonna have to go with it, it'll all be okay. Um, I'm gonna introduce a speaker who has deep roots in two places. Uh, raised in Iowa and now living in Palestine, uh, Dr. Omar Tezdale bridges and straddles and moves between worlds with such grace and insight. I cannot wait for you to hear from him. This is his first Prairie Festival, so go easy on him. Um, but he's not new to our work and he's not new to this barn. He's been a collaborator with the Land Institute since 2015, working on new perennial crop development, social perennial vision, the history and future of agriculture within limits, and also thinking about data infrastructure and how we share in our collective wisdom across geographies. Um, he says of the people of Palestine, Quote, they still intervene every fall to draw families in to pick the fruits and press the oil, keeping an ancient rhythm of life even amidst the fast-paced modern life in Palestine. And this, grafted onto wild olive rootstock, they have the ability to regenerate themselves and live for hundreds of years. I can almost not read it without weeping. He is so moving. And without further ado, Omar, please share your words with us. Thanks. It's great to be here. It's a pleasure to be here in this scientific place in this uh, spiritual place, this place of the Ka, Kanza, Osage, Pawnee peoples who were forcibly expelled four grandmothers and grandfathers ago. It is also the place of many European and other peoples who call it home, who are the beneficiaries of that expulsion. Many of those people are themselves the, the descendants of people who lived under the yoke of European feudalism before making the journey here. It is a history of oppression, and I hope that we can seek a transformation of all dominating peoples who bear responsibility to repair the wounds caused to this land and to its original people. <clears throat> I've been involved at the Land Institute for seven years now, since the first wonderful Ecospheric Studies Conference in 2015, but I've never been to the Prairie Festival before. I intentionally missed the barn dance last night. <laughs> um, it was not uh, something that I, I knew that I, you wouldn't want me there. Um, but it was wonderful to watch it from a distance. Um, it's also good to be here. It's uh, somewhat daunting to be here. I have so many friends here, and uh, I've written this talk in many ways for them, uh, because I, it's really another step in our conversation that's been happening for several years. So here goes. I come from two fertile crescents, intertwined in space and time, Iowa and Palestine. And if, it, if I look like an Iowan, and sound like an Iowan Palestinian, it's because I am. <laughs> uh, I've inhabited one world of endless horizons, a massive sky, gentle rolling hills, where the black, loamy, Des Moines lobe Soils of north central Iowa stretch so far out and so far down you can't even measure them. A gift from the ancient glaciers. 
With colonization, the grid of the land survey system imposed on its prairies and rivers, it locked the flow of human life into roads in the cardinal directions, north, south, east, and west. Yet the prairies remain in waiting, in the wetlands, in the fence lines, in the rivers. The native peoples stand also ready to return. I also inhabit another world of golden sunshine, stone terraces covering small mountains where cool evening Mediterranean sea breezes sweep up at sunset. Shallow red soils contrast with the silvery green leaves of the olive trees. The roads in Palestine follow the hills and valleys. They're the opposite of the roads in Iowa. <laughs> Hugging the meandering routes started as foot and livestock paths thousands of years ago, and now are roads for cars. And also with colonization, there too, uh, uh, a world of system, uh, a, a world of walls, cameras, borders has been imposed. And there too, the ancient forests and native peoples await and stand waiting for their return. Both lands are deeply beautiful and deeply wounded by the plow and human short-sightedness. In Palestine, humans slowly bred wild plants into crops like wheat and barley. In Iowa, Europeans brought these, these Palestinian crops to this land and added new ones as they were rolled out over the landscape by the Homestead Act. The wheat of Kansas is a prime example of a Palestinian plant. And both of these places are deeply wounded by these human systems of domination. After so many lifetimes of foraging and hunting amidst these forests, the great Palestinian perennial polyculture of olive, grape, and wheat did emerge. In turn, it became the oil, the wine, and the bread that has fed people for millennia and in turn became the famed center of Christian liturgy around the world. My university is called Bir Zit, which is the name of the nearby village and translates to olive oil well. They had so much oil from olives that they had wells of them in the ground to store it for the rest of the year. These are deeply rooted polycultures when I started our seed collection of native plants in Palestine, I only, I only started to comprehend just how deep the roots run. Cultures come and cultures go. Palestine has taught me this. This is the grief of climate crisis. However, when cultures go, cultures leave remnants. Today, I want to make a case for a remnant agroecology, which enables us to keep the possibility of human freedom and dignity open. More on that in just a moment. It's a tradition at the, the Prairie Festival, I think, according to the YouTube videos, um, that people introduce themselves, and it's also, I think, important. So I'll just um, say a little bit about my own roots. I'm a researcher and, and professor in Palestine, uh, in the hill region, amongst these olive terraces that I just described in the Mediterranean climate. I completed my PhD in geography and sustainable agriculture at the University of Minnesota. As an undergraduate at Iowa State, I spent more time in community meetings and in the streets than I did in classes. And I ended up with a custom major, how to unsuccessfully stop the Iraq war, which I <coughs> designed it all by myself. <coughs> I was born and raised uh, in rural Iowa to an American father and a Palestinian mother. I'm happy to say my father is here with us uh, from Iowa, and my family in Palestine are watching on YouTube. So, <laughs> Ours was an unconventional farm for several reasons. For one, it was an acreage where we raised sheep when almost no one else did. Um, we also uh, worked with renters to do almost everything you can within the corn and soy uh, beast. My father and his neighbors are learning in a gradual shift to more sustainable and regenerative practices. With our renters, his implemented terraces, cover crops, no-till production for 30 years now, prairie strips, again the prairies returning in the middle of the cornfield, filter strips, saturated buffers, grass waterways, for water protection, five acres of alfalfa, 
and now seven acres of Kernza, probably one of the first in Iowa. <coughs> In a neighborhood of big corn and soy farmers who farm lots of acres on glorious loamy soils, among the best in the world, and at a significant profit, I might add, we all stood out a little. Uh, we baled hay, we'd have a, we would bale hay in the summer, and then we would have lamb and rice around an Arabic-speaking dinner table. My Palestinian and American families, like the two fertile crescents, are also deeply intertwined in time and space. My father's family are Quakers, who are mischievous Christian pacifists, who believe that service, <laughs> <coughs> service is better understood in a community uh, rather than a military sense. So they served others in China and Palestine out of their social justice faith. And believe it or not, my American grandparents served in Palestine and in Gaza, of all places, and helped to set up one of the first refugee camps there instead of going on their honeymoon after their marriage in Iowa. At the same time, a couple of hours away, my, great, my Palestinian grandparents were being made into refugees. They too were relatively newlyweds with two new babies, one of whom was my mother. They fled their home on foot, terrorized like so many families around the world across human history. In other words, in 1948, one side of my grandparents left their comfortable lives to stand with Palestinian refugees, and on the other side, they were being made into Palestinian refugees, forced from their home, to which they have yet to return. <laughs> Speaking of the Holy Land, my mother was born and hailed from a town called Lid, which, according to the book of Acts, chapter 9, is one of the first places that people became Christians when the apostle Peter healed a bedridden man called Aeneas. This intertwined history offered a certain flavor to life, as you can imagine. We, real, we lived rel relatively normal lives, revolving around rural schools, except in the summers where we would visit our family in Jordan and Palestine. Today, the cycle is flipped. I live in Palestine with my own family, now for nine years, attend a Quaker school, our, ch our children, and visit Iowa in the summer. So now we find ourselves in some climate and human crisis. What is this crisis? A crisis of climate or a crisis of greed? How much of a crisis is it? Are we indeed threatened? Are human society at risk? In the US, we know, we ask questions now of how we will survive in the coming violence and migrations, the new forms of human exploitation. These are questions that enslaved and colonized peoples have always asked. They're not new questions. I live in a place where human cultures and violence have come and gone for thousands of years. As the Palestinian scholar Edward Said has said, these cultures have left an infinity of remnants in the culture and in the landscape. However, the remnants have no inventory, no guide, and the main task is to make one. And following on the Palestinian poet Mahmoud Darwish, the answer to this guide lies in time and not in geography. These are words, there are words, for example, that we use in Palestinian dialect today that predate the coming of Arabic and like living seeds remain in our speech for more than a thousand years now. So the main question for my talk today is, what are the future remnants for food and agriculture that we are making now? How can we bring these remnants, the wisdom of our ancestors, other beings, natural processes, to bear upon this crisis? These questions weigh on my mind, and to begin to answer them, coming as I just have on a fossil-fueled joyride from my home in Palestine, which is also the Holy Land, and given the prophetic nature and tradition of the Land Institute, I think it appropriate to open with a 2,000-year-old passage from the great Palestinian healer known as Jesus, speaking to the crowds on a hillside only a couple of hours drive from my current home overlooking the Sea of Galilee. This passage comes from the Gospel of Luke as part of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. He's just finished telling his followers to love their enemies. He didn't say don't have enemies, he said love them. Which, believe me, was quite the departure from the warring patterns of the time including now. 
So it says, the passage, for each tree is known by its own fruit. Figs are not gathered from thorns, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. This passage is, is as complex as it is plain spoken. It is often seen as a warning against deception. I, don't, I do think the passage is about discernment. There are many thorns and thistles in the Fertile Crescent. There are many thorns and thistles here and in all parts of the world. Both grapes and figs are also in season right now in Palestine. In the heart of the dry season, delightfully juicy fruits in the driest, thorniest part of the year. It is also now um, almost the Jewish New Year, which begins exactly with the coming and the end of the dry season and the beginning of the rainy season. It is also the Feast of the Cross for Christians who light a large fire uh, tomorrow, um, on, uh, tomorrow Sunday, um, where they anxiously await the beginnings of the rain so that they can, and all people, Muslims and Christians, all Palestinians, can begin the olive harvest. They don't dare start the olive harvest until the first sprinkles. The idea here is that it might seem to be that knowing the difference, the, the guide here is to know the difference between the fruits and the thorns. But maybe the trick is more understanding that each tree is known by its own fruit. In other words, possible to be known by its fruits. Soren Kierkegaard wrote on this passage in his writings on love, and he says, quote, for one is not, not to work in order that love becomes known by its fruits, but to work to make love capable of being recognized by its fruits, whether these are recognized by others or not. In this endeavor, one must watch themselves so that this, the, the recognition of love, does not become more important to him or her than the one important thing, that it has fruits and therefore can be known, end quote. This passage and the overall idea is about knowing and unknowing. And to tie to the theme of the talk, there is really no way to know what will be a useful remnant in the future. We really, we think we might know what a saving remnant might be, but it may not be recognized in the future. We can't force recognition of our work, but we can make them capable of being recognized at a future time. It's a subtle but very important distinction between thinking you know and making it possible to be known. I think one of the biggest questions for our current climate crisis is how do we know where to put our energy when it seems that our range of human influence is so limited? In plant breeding, for example, recognition is one of the most important features. It's done through cycles of phenotyping in which the plots are constantly um, uh, going through process of, processes of recognition. It's probably the most crucial step in plant breeding, or one of them. Here, also, temporality is given a crucial lag time between the tree growing and the cycles of it giving fruit. So the future orientation is crucial. We can only invest energy in starting processes that may bear fruit at a possible future scenario. And these processes must be built on our understanding of the historical reality that brought us to the particular moment. So when we start something, we're only really activating a remnant or someone or some other process has left behind. And fruits and seeds are like time travelers. They bend and twist time and place to suit their purposes to increase the possibility of spreading. So I want to use the growing from the ground down theme of this year's Prairie Festival as an invitation into that tension of knowing and not knowing between learning and unlearning, between what is assumed to be known and what is made capable of being known. It's a fine distinction, but I think an important one as the work of perennial grain agriculture and natural systems agriculture and deep adaptation to climate change and resource overshoot are upon us. I build on the tra traditions of my ancestors and teachers who have found inspiration in both the prophetic and the technical, tensions between knowing and not knowing, between immediate results, between immediate and long-term results, in the fruit and tree passage, there's contained both seeds and roots. Fruits can be more easily seen and measured, whereas roots are more difficult to measure and control. 
Both are necessary to the growth and reproduction of a fruit-bearing plant. A fruit is a seed-bearing structure that allows flowering plants to spread their seeds. Seeds play with time because they work on specialized and adaptive time scales. A root is a more universal structure. It supports the vascular plant, a vascular plant and, so, and transports water and nutrients to it. When I started our seed collection several years ago, I soon realized the potential of, of these living beings. Both seeds and rootstocks are technologies of tri time travel which embody the historical legacy and the future potential. Perhaps they serve as a concrete example of a future remnant as they carry potential of both past and future in the case of the rootstock as a clone and in the case of a seed as a child. In the same way that the prairie plants and so many other histories and cultures and peoples lie waiting around us here. So I believe that humans do have the capability to learn things and unlearn things when the stakes are painfully clear enough. I wouldn't be a researcher or a teacher if I didn't think so. We have in our cultural heritage the ability to conserve and persist if needed. I remember my grandfather telling me about life on the farm in Iowa in the Great Depression, where they would heat up stones in the stove and put them at their feet at the bottom of the bed to stay warm through the night. In Palestine, you can still get your shoes and clothes repaired. Imagine that. Buy your local olive oil and your cheese, your oil in the spring and your cheese in the uh, goat cheese in the spring, uh, sorry, the oil in the fall and the goat cheese in the spring for the entire year. The earliest farmers in Palestine, after cutting down all of this for the Mediterranean forests, plowing, planting grains, did eventually build stone terraces to stop the stem of soil running down into the valleys. They did learn. The Dust Bowl led to the creation of the Soil Conservation Service in 1933. We did learn something there. After millennia, chattel slavery was outlawed and banned and ended. We learned something there. Today, my research and experiments to mow, our research group um, has experiments to mow the underbrush instead of plowing under the olive trees, a change in the production system that has been going on for thousands of years. And we're hoping to change that. So we do have the capability to learn. So then what is the task? What is the process of discovery and under what conditions and in within what limits? All of these are questions that we've been grappling with in Palestine in our discussions here at TLI. The Land Institute and its similar institutions have always sought, and I respect this very much, the more difficult and outside route. Uh, but on the other hand, we always and often um, insist on seeing fruits, more grants, more scientific papers, conferences, recognition of our work, all of which makes us feel good and recognized. But what are we losing sight of in the process? On the other hand, if we only work behind the scenes in quiet solitude, how are we to change and expand our understanding and relationships? It's a really big tension. And I think the distinction between making known and making capable to be known may offer some clues. I was thinking about using this chart as part of my process because this is the chart that explains anything and everything. <laughs> I don't think I have the guts to do it, though, so <laughs> I'm not going to do it. Um, so then the question becomes, why our work on the perennial grains agriculture in the place where annual grains agriculture was born, there in the Fertile Crescent? When you live in the Fertile Crescent, you are living in the midst of 10,000 years of agriculture. Believe me, history has a different resonance. As a researcher, I start thinking about what might be done when so many things have already been done. You start asking what could possibly be done in the, pre in, the be in the presence of an olive tree that has been feeding people with its oil for generations upon generations upon generations. There are olive trees in Palestine that are thousands of years old. There are olive trees in Jerusalem that have witnessed the Last Supper and remain. That's what I call regenerative agriculture. To be in the presence of such a being is an honor. Our research group in Palestine seeks to build more productive and just perennial crop landscapes. Our work in Palestine has been made possible by a wonderful team of bright young 
Palestinian researchers who are watching now on YouTube. We seek to transform these landscapes toward more just and productive features so that the future remnants might be found. We conserve the seed of so local perennial wild plants, the local knowledge about them, and build open source data structures to drive our research. Free and open source software and data stored in open formats is faster, more accessible to all, and more likely to stay available in the future, a future remnant. Plant breeding has always been open source. It's been open source since the beginning. So why wouldn't our data structures also today be open source? My research group is technologically and globally connected, but deeply grounded in our community of plants and people and other beings that make the landscape what it is. We publish our work in international scientific journals, but also in self-published community, uh, community science works based on research with our community. So we do kind of three things. I'll just run by them quickly here. We, uh, first, we make collections. Artists do it, plant breeders do it, writers do it, tractor lovers do it. <laughs> we are collecting the seeds of hundreds of species of native plants that could be used to transform the landscape. We're also collecting the knowledge of our elders and building open source digital platforms to share that knowledge responsibly. These include the first Arabic language digital platform for wild plant information, a geodata platform, and a small booklet on our wild food plants. Second, we are making, uh, attempting to make crops. We are testing numerous potential crops for our climate in collaboration with our colleagues here at the Land Institute and candidates that we have collected from the wild. Third, we are making communities. We're building networks of wild plant collectors, of young, composed of young students who are building uh, their own networks and uh, teams of researchers. We have a new course in, in the university on the flora of Palestine. And two of our uh, Palestinian team members have conducted internships here at the Land Institute, one in 2019 and one just this last summer. So if we were to continually learn from these natural systems and build agroecologies, then how might we learn from these olive trees or from the perennial wild barley that grows around our research sites? It's a big question. So as you can imagine, Palestine is a particularly challenging corner of the Fertile Crescent to work. Uh, it's a strip of land at the eastern end of the Mediterranean. You might imagine it a desert, but it, most of it is the Mediterranean climate, much like that of California. It's the Holy Land, a small place loaded with meaning for Jewish, Christian, and Muslim faith traditions. It's the southeastern tip of the crescent, of the Fertile Crescent. It's the ancestral homeland to just a couple of minor agricultural crops, you know, wheat, barley, oat, lentil, pea, flax, um, the wild relatives grow around, they grow on the sidewalks, they grow all over the place. It's also a land being colonized by Israel, who rules it, controls the borders, travel, water, food, roads, visas, electricity, internet, among other things. Our people are ruled over by one of the best funded military occupations in the world, with all the latest taxpayer funded tools of surveillance and war. In a tiny area, the size of three saline counties, so this county, three of them only. There is a powerful matrix of control, including 326 military checkpoints and road gates, 444 miles of walls, and roads that only certain kinds of people are allowed to use. For example, one of my team's research sites is 11 miles away. We have to drive through two hostile military checkpoints just to reach it and back through them on the way back. And all of this is only the West Bank, to speak nothing of the Gaza Strip, which is two million people locked up in an open air prison, or hundreds of towns and cities ethnically cleansed and destroyed, including my grandparents' town. However, with all of this power, funding, technology, they fail to completely control us. My students, friends, and family teach me about human freedom, resilience, and gaps in the system of control every single day. We live, go to school, do perennial agricultural research, take our kids to parks, 
collect plot samples, and go to soccer practice in this context. The limits imposed by occupation in Palestine give us a particular perspective on climate crisis and collapse. The limit has allowed me to learn and unlearn research methods under duress. The shrill debate in the first world here on climate crisis stems from our understanding of science and limits. Climate crisis is something to be known, to be managed, to be rendered pliable to modern solutions. These things are certainly useful, but do not fully address the central issue. Instead, what forms of knowledge making and scientific enterprise are actually required to adapt? When I speak with my students about climate crisis at the university in Palestine, under military occupation, where student activist leaders disappear from campuses and their homes in the middle of the night, held without trial, unable to travel within their own country, I talk to them about climate crisis and they shrug their shoulders. The COVID pandemic witnessed from Palestine left a similar feeling. The seeming nonchalance of the third world on climate is frustrating for its own reasons because of the provincialism that oppressed peoples develop. They develop a kind of myopia because of the, um, the situation and they see only their, often, only their local problems at the expense of global crises. And this is also frustrating to me because we want to be able to see global processes. In addition, oppressed people, unfortunately, exact oppression on each other, especially in terms of class and gender. As someone who straddles both worlds, I've had the privilege to unlearn many things, from the farm on the incredibly fertile Des Moines Lobes uh, soils of Iowa, to Palestine upon graduation, to stand with, upon my graduation um, from graduate school, to stand with my family and friends, Palestinians under military occupation. I've gotten a taste for adaptation under duress, to conduct research under duress. And when you live in Palestine, you unlearn long-term planning and are given a very deep sense of urgency. The challenge today is to prepare so that research on perennial grains agriculture might be conducted within limits and under duress. What might be done today to enable future generations to benefit from our work? Working within limits and under duress forces innovation. Limits force us to unlearn established boundaries. Limits create an environment where unlearning can happen. Imagine, for example, a doctor working in a far-flung far flung rural clinic versus one working in a big city. Within the US, working on the coasts or near big cities, or working here in the rural Midwest or rural South, there's a big difference. By way of conclusion, I mostly have questions. Many remnants stem from oppressions of human societies built on annual plow-based grain production. We should recognize our responsibility and culpability in the remnants that lie around us. Making right today and making room for the remnants of tomorrow. What is our array of future remnants? What remnants will each of us leave behind? If a tree is known by its fruits, how might the adaptations we learn become the fruits of tomorrow? It seems that we must work within deeper time scales, or at least that's my best guess. Like nature's temporal strategies, not within our shallow, unlike our shallow understanding of accomplishments and tasks. Working with an historical reality means activating past remnants in the present. It also means making our remnants, make it, working so that our remnants are capable of being known and recognized in the future. Like the tree, we release, we, we release fruits and cannot control what happens next. We have to ally with nature's timescales, arrange to adjust and modify what we can on its potential path so that there might be a possibility of perennial grain agriculture in the future. This contrasts with our human tendency, for example, on an overemphasis on planning, which is really more about controlling the present than opening future possibilities. When we give priority to time, we open possibilities for new formations and new life. What would a remnant agroecology look like? Crops we develop today might be taken up now or in the future, or they might not at all. I often think that there must be former crops in the landscape in Palestine, which we've never even heard of, and they're just sitting there, domesticated or half domesticated, waiting for us to recognize them. 
We start processes of community building in which uh, we, we also have to start processes of community building which are more just and adaptive, human agricultural societies. We can't control the recognition, but we can only start the processes in an act of faith. It's been said that certain places, especially places on the margins, are places that offer truth. My Fertile Crescents and their peoples, plants, land, offer future remnants for deep climate adaptation. The two Fertile Crescents of Palestine and Iowa have, been, have forced me to engage these questions. So I think that scientific research, it seem, uh, seems to me to be a, a, le a leap of faith that begins with, with questions. So I want to leave you with just two questions for those of us seeking to make perennial, diverse polycultures a reality. First, what remnants in food and agriculture are we making possible? And second, are we changing the world or making it possible for the world to be changed in the future? Thank you. Omar, and we have time for a couple questions. We cannot answer all questions, but we have another 24 hours together, so you'll have time, and Omar will be here. I forgot about that, sorry. Emily, you have the, we have microphones. Questions or one over here? So we'll go back and forth. Uh, could you comment on the on there we go? Uh, could you comment on the work of Gary Nabum and uh, Nikolai Pavlov? I, I just I'm just blown away by their stuff. Now I'm blown away here. Thank you. Um, Gary Nabhan, uh, Naban is um, one of our teachers. He's a, a leader in, in the southwest part of the United States. He's also of Lebanese uh, origin, and um, I his work has been an inspiration certainly. Um, he has, many of you probably know his work as well or, 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 or better than I do, but it relates to the collection of, uh, the, the protection and conservation of agrobiodiversity, especially in the, in the American Southwest. So yeah, it's definitely an inspiration. So, it's working, yeah. Yeah, there you go. Uh, so with the uh, changing climate um, and the traditions and your tension between uh, the known and unknown, um, if, the, if the rains don't come, do you go ahead and harvest? <coughs> That's a very good question. That's a very good question. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, it's, um, it's really interesting to think about that because right now um, in that climate, it's six months of dry and six months of, of wet season. And so many things revolve around that uh, question. The months, um, the ways that people measure time, the, uh, the rhythms of the seasons and the harvest season. Palestine's one of the few places left where olives are still harvested by hand. Uh, flam fam entire families um, spend their, the month of October um, in the olives. Um, and it will be interesting to see and we'll probably have to change traditions that are thousands of years old um, and modify them to adapt to this new climate crisis. Certainly, I think, yeah. Yes. Thank you for everything that you've shared. It's very deeply moving. And I wanted to ask you a question about that you um, stated that you were curious 
what will be found in the future, future um, grains or, you know, and I'm wondering what has been found that was a surprise and in mm -hmm. that same realm. Yes. Um, I mean, so many of, of the new grains and, and crops and things that come onto the market are things that are being found around the world. You know, imagine 50 years ago, quinoa, for example, right? And so many of these things that come onto the market um, in the U.S. and in, in, in the global north um, are things that have always already been there for so many peoples and cultures around the world um, and take on these new lives in, in other places. And I think that's part of, the human, his of, of human history. It's always been that way. In some in some way or another, um, yeah, we've been surprised to find things that were probably forages or things that could have been used for for animals, um, and wonder if they had been used before. And so it's kind of funny to say, oh, there's this new thing that's really interesting, you know, in a place where people have been raising sheep and goats for ten thousand years and how we know anything is new there, you know, is like an open question. So, but it's about recognition, you know, and it's about, I think, what I've learned from my friends who are plant breeders here, um, you know, so much of their work is this kind of discernment and recognition um, in the field and in the plots and a kind of judgment call that they have to make um, constantly, you know. Uh, Thank you. I think there's a question here. You do need... And um, oh, yeah. just letting everyone know we have time for this last question, very likely, so you'll have a chance to ask again. Thank you. Um, regenerative agriculture has become very kind of, um, let's just say it's popular nowadays. Um, what perspective can you offer from your two f fertile crescents on this whole notion of regenerative agriculture? Yeah. The question, I forgot to repeat the questions. Um, the, the question is about what kinds of perspectives can be offered uh, from these fertile crescents about regenerative agriculture. I mean, when I look at an olive tree that's a thousand years old, you look at it and it's really a tree, it's a tree, but it's not you know, it's, it's a new form of that tree that has regenerated itself over and over and over and over and over. So it's not a tr it, it is a tree, you know, um, but it's, it's, it's like constantly regenerating itself from the roots. Um, and so there are, if you look at one from the outside, there's all these hollow areas in the trunk where parts of that tree have gone away and new parts emerged. And so it's constantly kind of rebuilding itself. Um, but never the same. You know, every single, with each iteration, with each rebuilding, it, it changes. Um, and so I think there are lessons there for regenerative agriculture. The, the challenge with regenerative agriculture, I think, um, is that we need to have very, very diverse cropping systems and lots of different options and, and that ensemble of, of making them work together um, is really a, a, is a major challenge. And so maybe it's not really comparable, you know, one, a single individual olive tree is not comparable to an entire array of different kinds of crops that all have to, that have to work together in a kind of um, way, but I think there are lessons there to be learned um, about time. A lot about it is about time. Um, I'm putting more, I'm learning more, let's say, about that deep history um, because I think it, it shows us some ways forward. And a lot of what I tried to say today is really my own grappling. It's part of these conversations that I've had with so many of my friends here who I'm so happy to see. Um, and I think it's really a grappling with this, what seems like we have to choose between, you know, 
everything's going to be fine, technology's going to save us one option, or everything's going down, we're all going down, the other option. And I kind of refuse that dichotomy. Um, I think there, there, there has to be lessons that we can learn. And maybe those trees can show us. I mean, they, they come and go and, and regenerate and die and, and regrow. And is it the same tree technically? Kind of, yeah. Is it? But it's, you know, 2,000 years old. So, yeah. <laughs> you you absolutely can, but only after I check in on time. Hang on one second. We can do one more. Can you project from a loft? Yeah, I just was curious if you have um, any personal knowledge of uh, maybe an unleavened bread or something like that. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> It's been around a while, that unleavened bread, so. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing the way, oh, question. Uh, the question was um, whether there's a, a recipe for unleavened bread uh, that I could share. So I, the, um, the interesting thing to me about the bread and the wine and the oil polyculture um, is that really um, the way that that became part of the faith traditions um, is really much, much older than that. You know, it is the sustenance of people. And um, that relationship between the people and the land and two of the three, you know, are perennial crops. Wheat is not. Um, but the way that got, that got taken up, you know, it's the basis of the culture in that place for thousands and thousands of years. And then it becomes part of the faith traditions. I don't think it's a coincidence. Um, and so then it literally is used to sustain people, even in the religious practices, uh, especially within Christianity, but in, 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 in other faith traditions as well. So um, it's literally being made part of our, our bodies. And I've had a conversation with Wes a couple of times about um, this tension in, in Christianity between the celestial and spiritual and the biophysical. And in, in so many ways, it really is biophysical. Um, it's the ingestion of oil and wine and bread that, and anointing with oil that also is, is absorbed by your skin. So you're literally building your body with with it. So it is very much biophysical as well. So, thank you. Mm -hmm.